The day, a Monday. The weather, blazing hot. The time, approximately 9am. It is my first day as a fully-fledged teacher. Having successfully completed my graduate diploma in secondary education, here I was about to embark on my very first real paid teaching job. Sure, I somehow managed to navigate the 15 weeks of practicum as well as the deluge of assignments as part of my teaching qualification. But this was different. With my backpack full of the day's teaching resources and a heart full of nervous anticipation, I strode towards my first class. Clothes maketh the man, I had thought earlier that morning as I smugly decided that the tie, long sleeve dress shirt and pants, colour coordinator of course, I was wearing were absolutely essential despite being in the middle of a typical scorching Queensland summer. How wrong I was as I felt the sweat start seeping out of my pores the moment I stepped away from the vortex of slightly cooler air created by the fan directly above me in the staff room. As I continued anxiously, school map in hand, in the general direction of my first class, I was physically stopped in my tracks by a group of three white male students, ages unknown. Unclear of their intentions, I smiled at them. Just as I was about to wish the trio a good morning, one of the boys let out a shrill, Konnichiwa, you know speak English? and proceeded to demonstrate his best slant-eyed impression. Class hadn't even begun and here it was, my first microaggression and teaching micro-decision. What do I do? Do I address the obviously inappropriate behaviour? Do I ignore him? Do I react in some overly punitive fashion to salvage my own pride and position as a teacher? Was there truly a compromise between any of these extremes? I had mere milliseconds to decide before these students sniffed any sort of weakness, if I even so much as paused. Instead of jumping straight into what happens next, I pause my story here and ask you to reflect on what you would have done in this situation. For me, this incident was just one of my many run-ins with the essentializing discursive narrative of Asian deficit, which continues to instantiate my position as an outsider within the teaching profession. What did I do at that point in time? I'll get to this in just a moment. For now, let's jump ahead to what I'm doing here today. Madison's taught definition of the critical is the basis upon which Marx, Pennington and Chang, as well as Boylorn and Orp, advocate for critical autoethnography's usefulness in legitimating first-person accounts of discrimination and difference as a means of critiquing colonialism, racism, sexism, nationalism, regionalism and ethnocentrism. Boylorn and Orb further explain that critical autoethnography's commitment to political action inflects the following aspects of critical theory. To understand the lived aspects lived experiences of real people in context, to examine social conditions and uncover oppressive power arrangements, and to fuse theory and action to challenge processes of domination. How exactly does this work though? I move here to critical race theory's main methodology, counter storytelling. As a form of narrative, it takes experience and configures it into a conventional and comprehensible form. This is what confers it with communicative power, making it a powerful tool of persuasion and disrupting the dominant narrative, and therefore a potential transformative device for the disempowered. As Delgado elaborates, counter stories can jar the com comfortable dominant complacency that is the principal anchor dragging down any incentive for reform. Beyond this, counter stories, a, me a mechanism for reclamation, can also be therapeutic for the teller and for listeners from marginalized communities, as the act of telling can lead to healing, liberation, and mental health. As it turns out, Canon de Moulinier tell me that you might think of counter stories as critical auto ethnographies, but how exactly? Holman Jones outlines what she considers one of critical auto ethnography central commitments, that theory and story work together in collaborative engagement. This means that we use the vocabulary, the ideas, concepts, and languages of theory, and the mode of story, the forms, the relationships, and the worlds stories create to tell complex, nuanced, multiple, and critically reflexive narratives. How then do I, an Asian migrant teacher, write a critically reflexive counter-narrative in and through theory? Asian crit, of course. Asian crit, like critical race theory, also shares a commitment to intersectionality, social justice and praxis, and draws on narratives as the primary tool for social change. For the next part of the story, I focus on two of Asian crit's key tenets, Asianization and strategic anti-essentialism, all the while remaining mindful of Iftika and Muses' reminder that since the common political goal is to facilitate larger discussions of racism in society, Asian crit is intended to complement and not replace critical race theory. I'd since moved on from the racially diverse, lower socioeconomic co-educational state school 
to a predominantly white upper middle class independent girls school located in one of the most affluent suburbs in Brisbane. Moved on from that horrible incident with the three white male students. Moved on from that moment in time when I didn't, couldn't react quickly enough. That moment in time where I stood completely aghast and at a loss for words after the boys racist greeting and subsequent escape in different di directions laughing. All right, so are we all happy with how the logo game works? Just to reiterate, when it's your turn, you need to do your best to get all four questions on each of the question cards correct. Your turn ends either once you answer all four questions or if you get any of them wrong and your counter moves the corresponding number of correct spaces around the board. My year 11 business girls nod their heads in unison. I pull out question cards about the first Ford car model to be introduced in Australia, as well as one that asks which of the following is not a pineal clean scent, eucalyptus, lavender, lemon lime or fresh laundry. We eventually get to the dare iced coffee question card. The opposition teams groan as I ask Sarah, Nikita and M what the brand of iced coffee in photo A is. That's so unfair sir, they've got it so easy, we had such difficult questions. The groans reach a crescendo as I acknowledge M's correct response and ask what the normal volume of coffee in the bottles stocked in cold supermarkets is. Sarah pulls her weight and the team are immediately on to their third question. What is the colour of their iced coffee's double espresso flavour, green, yellow or black? After much squealing and deliberation within the group, Sarah, Australian-born, African descent and budding entrepreneur pipes up. Look sir, we can't decide. I think black is too straightforward of an answer. I reckon since I'm black and Nikita's yellow, I'm just going to go with green. We're surely not going to give the other groups a chance to steal our response. Sarah, you can't just say that. Anglo-Australian and future college captain M interjects. Guessing an answer? We're already out of time anyway. Not that, the other thing. M's face is completely flushed and I soon realise she's chastising Sarah for talking about colour, chastising her for bringing up race. Having read up on colour blindness in schools the previous weekend, I was galvanised into reacting differently this time, into not being at a loss for words. In that moment, I find that my head takes a while to catch up with my heart and flounder on with what I think could be a good teaching opportunity. Hmm, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with what Sarah said, M. I mean, Sarah is obviously of African descent and Nikita and I are both of Asian descent. I don't see any issue with calling it like it is. After all, there's nothing wrong with being a minority or not being white Australian. It does become an issue when we start lumping all minorities into indistinct monolithic groups though, as in assuming that everyone in that group is exactly the same, and even worse, conferring certain negative stereotypes or assuming some degree of deficit or lack of everyone in that particular group on the basis of that sameness. That's just going to be downright damaging. For example, my wife constantly reminds me that I tend to be quite a reckless driver, so I suppose I fulfill the Asians are bad driver stereotype to some extent. But compare that with what you told me about your road trip over the holidays, how Nikita was probably the smoothest and safest driver in the group. Now imagine how terrible it would be if all driving examiners immediately assumed Nikita was a bad driver before she even hopped behind the wheel. I mean, we could get into a whole other discussion about the assumption a lot of the girls here have about the English ability of our Japanese exchange students, but I think you kind of get my point. I can see the well-oiled cogs in M's brain spinning and use that as an opportunity to take my reassertion a little further. So yes, I think we need to be able to speak plainly about colour to be able to address inequity. If we link that back to the business context, what other ways are businesses going to be able to recognise deep-seated disadvantage among certain communities and subsequently act on it as part of their corporate social responsibility? Anyway, that's my two pence worth at least. By this point, M's cheeks had turned from a scarlet red to a mellow pink. I could see that she was still pondering my little speech, possibly realising in that very moment the colour discomfort that stemmed from her whiteness. However, before either of us could say any more, we are abruptly interrupted by the lunch bell. As I mentioned earlier, I'm here today to share my story of recapturing racial narratives. In so doing, I would also like to take this opportunity to think and wonder out loud about what I believe deserves much more meaningful deliberation. That is, if in my vocation as a high school teacher, I truly am on the right track to jar the comfortable dominant complacency perpetuated by the overwhelming presence of whiteness that pervades the Australian classroom. Am I doing the very best I can at this stage to fuse theory and action to challenge processes of domination while reclaiming what has previously been kept silent? 
Is this how, with the goal of tackling racism in mind, I best reassert our right to be heard? I wonder, what else would you do in my situation? Thank you again for engaging with my story today. I would love to receive any questions, comments or feedback via email.